I'm happy to uh, announce and greet our panelists. Um, first of all, Mike Ott. Um, Mike, please come on stage. <laughs> also, congratulations again for that wonderful film. Um, yeah, Mike is a filmmaker who has been uh, doing feature films for around 12 years now, I think, and uh, whose films uh, show a great loyalty, I think, to the state of uh, California, often um, like limiting to specific places that also lend titles like Little Rock and uh, Lake Los Angeles. And um, this movie was mainly shot in Lancaster, um, California. Um, the next panelist is Margit Shield. Margit, please come up. Margit is an um, artist, curator, and a process designer based in Berlin and Vancouver. She's at the moment also part of a research project in Vancouver. And um, as a filmmaker, her last um, movie was called Drifter, in which she worked with um, refugees and migrants. Welcome, Margit. <laughs> and our last panelist, Violetta, please come on stage. Violetta Kovacic, I hope I said it correctly this time. Um, a film critic, teacher, um, and uh, editor and festival curator from Barcelona. She is um, the uh, how do you call it, the president of the Spanish Film Critics Association. She teaches film history in Barcelona, and she's the editor-in-chief of the um, Fantastic Film Festival ca of Catalonia. Is that correct? Yeah. Perfect. More. <laughs> Welcome. Please sit down. So um, let's get right into the discussion, maybe as a preliminary remark um, on the topic of unfinished. Last year, from March until September, there was a big exhibition in the Metropolitan Museum of New York called Unfinished, and it had the wonderful subtitles, Thoughts Left Visible. And um, the main idea is that artworks that bear the traces of their production because they have not been completed, allow the viewers to speculate on the artistic process themselves, thus enabling another kind of imagination, thus enabling another kind of connection to the artworks. And just as a beginning, I think um, one could try to differentiate between three different kinds of unfinished artworks that also applies to film. One would be the unfinished film, which are, or the unfinished artwork, which for one reason or another could not be finished, like the movie um, about Mexico from Eisenstein or about Brazil from um, um, Orson Welles. But there are also fin uh, uh, artworks and films that um, specifically and deliberately leave traces of their production process. In the art world, there is an Italian term called non finito, like visible brush strokes or blank canvas. And then there's a last uh, uh, term that could be said that it's process oriented. It's artworks that never really aim at being finished or completed in a strong sense of the world. So in between those two, I would like to um, have a discussion with our panelists. And Mike, maybe I can start with you because we just saw your wonderful film. So. Um, like talking about unfinished, your film um, has a lot of interest in showing um, parts of its production process, mainly casting. Also, the last movie that you finished, um, Hector Martinez, heavily featured casting and the preparatory work for making a film. Could you let us in a little bit why you um, are so interested in showing um, how a movie is um, prepared and produced inside the movie itself? Um. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. I think like, uh, I mean, I think casting is a really interesting process. Also like one of the most depressing processes like for actors to come in. And it's something I'm fascinated by about like coming in and like constantly getting rejection um, and chasing this thing, which I think like, um, especially in LA, like most people that are into acting are into it for like very strange reasons about being rich or famous and not about really acting. Um, so I think, I mean, I'm attracted to that about it, I guess. Um, because for me as a viewer, it's very interesting because if I watched a finished film, so to say, um, I uh, normally tend not to think about all the persons that were casted and not taken in the end. So by putting this casting process in the middle, it kind of also reflects back to movies that I watch and think about, you know, roles that uh, where actors haven't been casted. So I was wondering whether this is something that you are thinking about, that you know you actually show people that try to be casted in films and um, that there is the possibility of not being successful. Um, no, I mean, not so much. I, th I think, like, initially I was just interested in this idea of, like, w how the monologue... Th th I mean, th when we did the casting sessions, it was for them to come in and pick a monologue from their favorite film. 
um, and I was interested to see like how that relates to like the person, like secrets about the person or what what they don't know about themselves. Um, the film that they're most attracted to like says something about their inner self. Yeah. And then um, when I checked online, this movie is termed a feature documentary. Um, which, uh, first of all, I it was interesting for me to learn because um, obviously there are a, a, a lot of traces of reality, but then it's very stylized and, uh, you know, there's a, there is a plot line also in uh, evolving. And I was wondering, because it's kind of a hybrid form, um, you could say, between, you know, documentary methods and fiction methods. And I was reminded of a, um, like a saying by um, the filmmaker Pedro Costa, who also works in between fiction and documentary, uh, but in a completely different um, aesthetic register. And he said, all of my film, each film is a prototype. Is that something you can relate to? Also because you seem to be getting back to uh, similar topics, actors, places. Wait, what did he say? Each film <laughs> is a prototype. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't, yeah, no. It's not, uh, nothing that you can relate yeah, no, to I specifically. Can't really relate to it, no. Okay. And this um, like um, usage of the documentary form, because um, it's really interesting, because if there are traces of reality, something like, you know, we feel like the movie inhabits the same world that we do, yet it um, takes certain liberties in how it deals with this reality. Yes. Is that something, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <a question. laughs> Is that something that you consciously um, like, uh, uh, like use in your films? Um, yeah. Violetta, maybe um, coming to you. <laughs> uh, we, uh, by the way, we have to share um, some uh, our microphones. I can also give you mine. Uh, Violetta, this um, idea, you know, you, you watched the film. And uh, like, uh, let us talk about your impressions about the film. You know, the, the, the approach it took, how it um, dealt with its actors and, um, you know, how it kind of allowed us to um, speculate. Is that, you know, the real themselves or are they acting? Because, you know, it's also shifting between um, the monologues they pick personally and then, you know, it's uh, superimposed over the images. Does that, for you, open up the film to a certain degree? Um, yes, I think it does. But at the same time, um, there is something that I think it's interesting with this idea of um, a film which is not finished or this idea of a film open, as uh, you said. And it's... Um, it's just a detail, maybe, but uh, it's this idea that the film starts with the uh, screen still black mm -hmm. and someone is talking, and it ends with the screen also black and someone is talking. So I that's the idea of uh, like a piece of life that the camera suddenly is there, but it was before, life was bef before the film started and life will continue. So I think that shows you uh, how the film deals with this uh, openness, we could say. And as to the actors, as you were saying, I don't know, I, I think that um, maybe for me, there is a clear idea of a fiction regarding especially the uh, main character, but I think actually Mike should uh, talk maybe more about that, but uh, yeah, I think that's my impression. Thank you. Yeah, we will definitely come back to that, um, also because we will have um, Corey joining us on stage in some minutes. Um, Let's um, uh, broaden up the subject a little bit because you are teaching film history and you have a broad knowledge as a film critic. This kind of filmmaking that um, we want to call unfinished here or open, um, is there something like a tradition in filmmaking that could be adopted as such? Because we know that in festivals most of the films that we see are like, like pretty proper and finished artworks. And um, this idea that you know there are unfinished films that remain open and that you know allow the viewer to continue thinking about possible other versions they could have been. Do you know if there are historical precedents or if there are like aesthetic forefathers? Well, first of all, I think that uh, here the main point is that um, this is something that's really interesting, especially in modern cinema. So we're talking about uh, some um, European films, for instance, or even Hollywood films, but the, that weren't exactly classical movies from the classical period. And, um, and I'm saying that because, for instance, in classical movies, the idea of an end and the end, and uh, even the, the happy end, it was important. I mean, the whole story, even when there was chaos, the whole story was to arrive to this happy end or, th or this kind of closure in the movie. And this, the end, and even with, um, even when, when, when there was chaos, for instance. But, um, 
afterwards with modern cinema, this idea of an ending that it's so clear and so concrete is not that um, usual. And, um, and also there's the idea of a show the process and show that actually people are watching a movie and uh, that there are tricks and there are uh, things that um, are not real and uh, so it's a fiction. So I think it, it has to do with modern cinema. Okay. So it's not, it's not new, it's, not, uh, uh, it's something that it's, it already exists somehow, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Margit, coming to you. Um, yeah, talking about unfinished, obviously, uh, we are also implicitly at least talking about endings. Um, because um, artworks have the uh, possibility to be ended in a meaningful matter, whereas life, because you made up the opposition, often ends abruptly and cannot be interpreted. So um, about ending, can there be such thing as an unfinished film, given the art form that in the end, you know, you have to screen the thing and it has to be finished, it, it has to be done edited. Do you think that we can properly speak of an unfinished film in a purposeful way? No. <laughs> Could you elaborate on that? Um, yeah, as you said, the final result um, is something that has always the same form. So it, it's, a, it's a film, it's frame by frame, it's a film is running in time. So where is the unfinished moment? For me, um, it's more about f filmmaking, and I wonder why you're not brought up the term improvisation, for example. Not so yet. <laughs> not yet, okay. But um, how could a um, film be unfinished? Even this one was finished. I mean, it was edited, and there was uh, the credits. So. Oh, I thought it was finished, too, yeah. Yeah, it, it was a finished movie, so. <laughs> So the unfinished part for me is more about how you are creating the filmmaking process and if you allow yourself and your team to improvise during this process. And But I think, before you, we go deeper into the subject, every filmmaker knows what knows about improvisation, right? You always have to deal with limited factors. So if we think about improvisation as an approach on filmmaking, we have to unfold what we are talking about. Then let's directly get into that. I think um, you, you mentioned the most important um, part, and that's process. I mean, we have two practical, um, we have two filmmakers here. So um, Margaret, first to you, um, like for example, in your, I think, last project from 2015, Drifters, if I'm uh, correct, Drifting, um, you were working with non-professional actors. Um, um, could you talk a little bit about the process? How, because also about the ethics, if you um, uh, have a process that does not think from the position of a finished product, but you know, it develops itself while it is being shot and rehearsed and um, acted. Um, okay, that some things to say about this because um, even when you have a part in the filmmaking process where you are going into a really risky procedure, just an example what I'm talking about. In drifting, I worked with people who had a refugee and migrant background and I asked them to improvise and to um, make a drawing in, a, in 10 minutes without preparation, one after the other. So, and this was really a risky procedure, asking people who never, for example, worked with drawings, or, and then we had three cameras, um, and they have to come up ad hoc suddenly, and in the very moment with a drawing, without preparation, this was really something. And um, so this, but this, even this was in a specific, I put these sequences in a specific order. So I combined um, a finished form with open, improvised moments. So, does it make sense? Yeah, totally, because these improvised moments, they, um, you know, 
think from the perspective of the viewer. Um, you know, even though we see a finished pro uh, project, uh, a finished product, we have the ability through this, you know, being part, at least being shown parts of, you know, the, the, the improvisational process, how it all came about. So w we start to, to have an imagination about how, how art is being, being created. So we have a second layer. That's what, um, why I think it is an important procedure. But even if you have a second layer where you um, you created the framework for an open process, even if you have this, in my opinion, it has nothing to do with the final result. Either the viewer is getting the idea or not, it depends on your final idea. So even, I mean, in this movie, Drifting, it was, the de my desire was to capture an artistic expression that was made by laymen, by, by people who never w were in this situation before. But the viewer would never, um, I mean, the viewer just see, sees the result, but not the, ma the process, how it's made. So there are so many varias variations, so many different ways w to work with improvisation. Okay. Um, Mike, if I can turn to you again, and maybe we can ask Corey, if he's here, to join us on stage. Um, <laughs> do <laughs> Just, you know. I'm here. I'm yeah. here. I up in the beginning. I yeah. Really I don't know, maybe you ran away. So so we were talking about processes, and um, now I would like really love to know um, how does Mike work with actors? Whoa! Yeah. Or with you? Well, I don't know. Like I've known Mike for like ten years. Yeah. So I mean, I think well, I don't know. I guess the movie was dedicated to me. Am I your muse? I'm not. <laughs> no, no. Um, I think when you're working with your best friends, though, it like means the world to everyone and like working with mike i remember like just real quick can i tell you a story I'm s I'll, I'll try and make it fast but I, I told mike i said mike like can i just direct a scene for the heck of it and he's all like bro pretty much i'll let you direct every scene and like it is kind of the truth and that really like meant a lot to me like i don't know if you think as it is being an actor like you get to tell the story you know, like I'm telling Mike's story, so I'm hoping I'm always doing a good job. Um, <laughs> you're the best director I've ever, I mean, ich liebe dich. No, M Mike, also from your perspective, um, like you start a project, you have an idea about the project, you start working with people. Um, how flexible do you remain during the process? How much input do you get actually from, from, from the actors? Um, well, with this one, I mean, when we started it, we didn't really know what we were making. We were just doing these auditions and having people come in. Um, but I guess, I mean, working with Corey, like, I, I would always say that he always makes all of my ideas better. If I have something I think that I want him to say, like, he will always fuck it up and say the wrong thing, <laughs> but he'll mix it better. Um, and that's what I love about working with him. And he does every take differently and um, can't remember any lines. <laughs> but, you know, they're always better than the ones I wrote. So, so is it, uh, w would you call this a method that you're improvising? Or um, is, it, is it a certain, like, a very specific way how you two work together? I think specific, totally, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, do you have an average uh, of see uh, uh, sh uh, shots? How many, uh, uh, like, how many shots you take uh, for a scene, or is it like sometimes the first one works, and sometimes you know, like you have like twenty repetitions? Well, I mean, this film is different because you know, like for instance, the interview scenes in the car is just Corey asking them questions, whatever he wanted to talk to them about. So we didn't do takes or anything. I would maybe whisper questions to him to ask. Um, and the stuff with his mom, I mean, that was just the two of you talking, and I would sometimes text him questions to ask, but. Um, there was no retakes really in this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Violetta, if I can um, now turn to you, um, since you have uh, seen the film today, um, or just now, uh, better said, do you feel something of this, like this intimacy in the way the finished product uh, treats its subject? An intimacy, you mean? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, 
Actually, I liked a lot. Um, I don't know if I, uh, can I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> 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 um, because I would like to know, and now we were talking about improvisation, and actually there is this uh, beautiful scene when uh, with the rehearsals, and someone uh, says to you, uh, you're uh, very good uh, improvising, right? Oh yeah, and at the acting class. Yeah, how, how was this acting class? W was it real, not how, how does it work? What did you think, Cor, about the acting class? It was honestly one of my favorite scenes that we got to film. Um, I mean, do you mind if I take, take over the mic? Good, good. Um, yeah, it was cool. It was, no, it was total improvisation. I actually, what I really got to say I respect about Mike, though, is that in a way, no, no, I know, but like, no, 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 like, uh, uh, real quick, it, it is very organic. Like, I actually didn't know. I thought that was like a legit acting class. You know, I was in a way kind of kept in the dark. But I think it was good because I was like more natural and like, I mean, I pretty much get to run the show no matter where I go. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> I totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. It 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 looks natural because it is natural. Like, like. I was a little bit, yeah, yeah. You know, like I had to talk to all those people there who I didn't even know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even get to act the girl with I wanted to. <laughs> but it was still good. Um, Margaret, um, uh, talking about improvisation, because you, um, uh, you know, brought the brought the term into the discussion. Uh, <laughs> um, you, you have a concept that um, I would like you to um, explain, because if I try to explain it, I, I'm sure that I'm going to make a, um, a mistake again. But it's the provisory. Um, or the provisorium, um, as compared to the improvisation. Um, could you tell us quickly what you mean by that? Those aren't even the little words you're saying <laughs> right now. Well, you just made all those up. Provi provi provisory? Like, provisory is, cannot be a word. Cannot be a word. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see, maybe. Sorry. So I would rather say provisional solution. Provisory. No. Provisional. 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 Solution. It's like my favorite word right now. I swear <laughs> to God. I swear to God. I'm going to try and use this as much as I can. Sorry. Sorry. No. Please. <laughs> so you would like me to explain? Please. Okay. Um, I, I like the word and the concept about provisional solutions i mean there is a most there is a i like the the german word more it's provisorium but in the in the translation is a bit weird it's, it's not that nice i think and uh, but what is interesting about the provisional solution that this term is has a is connected to improvisation and improvisation is a wide recognized skill in dance and yeah, um, what uh, in dance and acting, for example. S but the provisional solution is a term that I call the term is a little brother or the little sister of improvisation, and the term is connected. Improvisation has um, th they have the same meaning, and actually they are the same. But when I work with people who are not specifically in the art context, I always use the word provisional solution because this, this core strategy is the same. It based on the same core strategy. And this is interesting. If you work with people who are not connected to art, they immediately they know what I'm talking about. So this is uh, something every person in the world, I never met a person that uh, never made a provisional solution uh, in in their for example in the household or whatever fixing something you know so everybody knows what i'm talking about but uh, improvisation you have to explain it you know if you talk so please improvise then you have to explain it what you what what do you mean but uh, provisional solution is a word that is really is interdisciplinary transdisciplinary everybody everyone knows what i'm talking about yeah, please, Corey, I mean, say something. No, like, 
No, I, I, I uh, back to the improvisation again, though, like real quick. It, it wasn't totally all improv, you know. There was a lot where I was discussing, like, hey, you know, how does this work, kind of, <laughs> and 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 I think it turned out good. I do, yeah, I do. Thank you, Cor. It was a lot of acting, <laughs> though. Too. Are you happy with the results, so to say? Mm. You don't like the movie so much. I don't like the movie so much, but but I I just like if 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 you like the movie, like I thought it was sad, but then like I guess it wasn't so sad, so maybe it was like really more hurtful than laughing. what I thought. Corey, Corey cried the first time he watched it, didn't he? I did, yeah. Well, I mean, all my movies, I always put like uh, literally all my emotion in. Like, I mean, that was a real scene where, like, usually Mike, after every take, is saying, please don't cry. Like, let's just get through this. And, you know, I just do my... <laughs> it is tough, though. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. Um, so, Mike, um, one thing about the production process. Um, if I'm not mistaken, a part of the film was already a short film and was um, shown before. Um, is it, like, did it end up in the movie or was it, like, a rehearsal or a preliminary shot? I think, yeah, most of it ended up in the movie, yeah. Do you know which, uh, or can you tell us which scene it is? Where Corey's talking in the car with the, the guy and he's talking about the mental institution and all that stuff. Um, which was just a moment we captured on another film where we were like waiting for the sun to change and Corey and the other actor were sitting in the car and Corey has this kind of beautiful moment where he talks about all of his sexual experiences, um, which was kind of the impetus for a lot of the movie. Okay, so um, it's like, first of all, the movie was sparked by making another movie, so to say. Um, and I was wondering, um, the production company where I think almost all of your movies uh, are produced um, is called Small Form Films. Is that also some kind of an aesthetic um, like program? Like that you make, um, like what do you understand as being a small form film? Yeah, I mean it was something Tom Anderson taught me in class about the small form and the large form, about approaching a subject. What is the small form and the large form? I don't remember it so much, it was a long time ago, <laughs> but uh, at the time I really liked the idea. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, we would open up the discussion for the audience. Are there questions in the audience? Oh, really, really far back there. Um, I would give my microphone in the last uh, row. Uh, hi, um, Mike. Um, do you are you aware that actually you're making a new gender uh, a g a ranger uh, uh, of filmmaking that is the honest, honest realism? Because this thing that you guys are talking about before about the unfinished, for me, losing a material from another film is that the next film could be also continuous. I, that is the unfinished thing about this known process. And losing people, and I, I saw all the films from Mike, <laughs> and basically is a constant uh, sort of a re-tuning um, of the process, you know, of filmmaking and film um, approaching. And I think that's, is, I don't know, did you have an intention, Mike, to start something totally new in film? No, but that's a good compliment, thank you. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you think, Cora? You're super new wave, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think super so. new wave. Like, totally, <laughs> it's, it's totally new. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I with, uh, with every film, I think we've, we've started it not totally knowing where they're going, and they've we all- We make real life movies, though. I think so, like, me and my mom discussing the application, like, I mean, that's like no more than real life than ever. I mean, like, <laughs> I think so. I think so. And I like it because it's it's sweet and then it has this nice part, you know. It's not just super sad or super happy. It has like, you know, this and that kind of. So, yeah, yeah I agree. Super real. Um, 
So I'm just going to say that I feel my st that because Mike blurs fiction and reality so much in this movie that in a way, like when you exit this theater and if you run into Corey, you are you are part of the fiction and the reality. You know what I'm saying? And part of the movie. Can you imagine that you come home to Berlin? Yes, because <laughs> like he did end up in Berlin. Okay, he's not making a movie, but he has a movie. So like the lies like kind of twist so much. So mm. when you're out there and you're saying hi to Corey, you're kind of in the film in a way. Mm. That's all I wanted to say. And I think that's cool. Hello guys, um, so I thought it was very interesting how at the end of the film you came up with this idea that there's just money everywhere on this field and it, it really brings to life the fact that so much of the film feels so real and then at that point in the film it's so fictionalized and it feels like a fantasy, like I was just waiting for him, for Corey to just wake up from a dream. Mm. What gave you that idea or did you construct that idea to juxtapose the reality of the film? Um, I, was, I, was making, I was trying to make another short film that I never finished with Corey and Patrick, the, the Filipino kid, um, where they were going to talk about three subjects, like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I think we started the first one, which was drugs. Yeah. Yeah, you were telling Patrick about the drugs you did. And Corey had somehow told that weird story about how he finds money. Um, and so we ended up using that in here, and we were not knowing what how we were going to finish the film that's and how you came up with that yeah, scene. yeah i didn't know that whoa <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you that's <laughs> um yeah and so we had that idea based on this kind of interview that Corey tells this weird story that he found basically 20 dollars over 28 years um, <laughs> and that's how, and that's how you get by <laughs> um yeah i, I like mean that now yeah so much more <laughs> makes sense Because Henning offered Corey to be in a movie. Oh, yeah, and he lives in Berlin. And he bought my passport. And he, and he bought his passport, yeah. He did, I mean, he did really buy his passport in real life, and this is the first time he used it. Cool. Are there any more questions or comments from the audience? Ah, really in the back? Like, not even in the last row? Stop, wait for the microphone. No. <laughs> I don't know, I um, just came back from the toilet, but uh, how, did <laughs> how did you come up with the idea for that movie? I talked about it already while you are in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay, Malik. <laughs> also, if anybody wants a poster, we have a bunch of posters for the film if anybody wants one. Um, is that another, another comment? No, this is a poster. <laughs> Anything else from the audience? Yeah, oh, over here. Um, I was going to ask Corey where he's going to party tonight. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do know. Where are we partying tonight? That's the question. Wherever I go, like, you can just all come. Like, please, you're more than welcome. Like, I think we're just going to go grab a drink somewhere and keep it pretty chill. So where, where are we going? Someplace in, in, in Dwizzledorf, I think. <laughs> No, we are not going to go to this little <laughs> Is there anybody, uh, uh, any other questions or comments? No? Then I think we can go to yeah. the next step, which will be partying. Ah, we're going to party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thank you.